Uh, you can see from the first slide who I am and who, which, what my affiliation is. The picture is the Nungate. The Nungate as it was in about 1946. Most of these lovely vernacular buildings have gone, I'm afraid. Oops. So if I press page up, it should yeah, move I'll on to the next one. The, I'll choose the arrows. Ah, yeah. right. Page down. All right. A aerial photograph on the left is the Nungate about the same period. Now, on the left-hand side, on the west bank of the Tyne, you have the Toon of Harrington, the county town, and over the river, you have the Nungate, a suburb of Harrington, linked by the medieval bridge you can see in the foreground there. That was the only bridge until 1900. So why the Nungate? Well, it's a bit different, is their answer. A different historically, it called the Nungate, as you might guess if you've knowledge of Scots, that it was the road to the convent, the nuns' priory about two miles east across the river there, and the land belonged to the nuns. It had its own belly on the town council from 1400s at least, so it's different historically, but it's also different in a rather negative sense. It was regarded very much from the late 19th century as, in that American expression, the wrong side of the tracks, the wrong side of the river in this case. Place of you know, petty crime, overcrowding, poor people, uh, poaching, and even when I moved to Harrington in the 1970s, poaching was a kind of open secret there. One of the poachers kept, dried his nets in his back garden and he had a freezer full of fish in his garden for some reason. Uh, there was a pitch and toss school on a Saturday and so on. This signpost in East Lothian, uh, their distances are measured to one eighth of an eighth of a mile, very precise there. That illustrates this sort of dichotomy. It's the same town is directing you to, but that way lies the Nungate, the other way lies um, Haddington. Quote from a local historian, the census returns bear out what he says, but not in such a <laughs> pejorative way of speaking. The population boomed from about the 1860s. A lot of the people living there were agricultural labourers, itinerant workers, hawkers, quite large families of hawkers. He was probably remembering it when these fine buildings were there. They fell to bits in the 1900s and alas are no longer with us. The whole scope of the project was uh, the Nungate from 1851, first really informative census, up to the end of local government in 1974. Uh, we looked at archives, of course, the local paper, the Courier, which has been part indexed. Favourite headline to date is Lump Found in School Pie. <laughs> Cutting edge journalism in the Courier. Uh, we also have police reports. Uh, unfortunately, no mug shots because it's pre photography, but there are five types of criminal nose, including broken. Uh, images, paintings like the one that you saw, but I chose for today this rather pointed one. I beg your pardon, I'll just go back to it. This is uh, members of the Lothian and Yeoman, uh, Lothian and Borders Yeomanry, about 1908, I think, but these guys, of course, were packed off to the Western Front in August 1914. Testimony, that's really what I'm going to speak about, oral testimony. One of our interviewees. We recruited our people purely by word of mouth. Once one spoke, others said, oh, you need to speak to so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so. There's the oral recording is going on a huge scale these days. Uh, we are, of course, sitting in a university which has the Scottish Oral History Centre as part of it. But there are huge projects, not only in history, but my background is in linguistics, and there is a huge amount of recording there. A hundred million words there, a hundred million words elsewhere. Apparatus has moved on considerably. That's Lorne, John Lorne Campbell's on the left-hand side. Ours on the right, and the apple is for scale. It's not a reward for the interviewee. <laughs> hey. You'll recognise Hamish Henderson bothering some crofter out in the macher. We do it in the comfort of the workroom in our local museum. One of the... It's semi-scripted, our interviews, so one of the uh, ways of getting people to open up was simply say, tell us about an experience you remember, particularly from your time in the Nungate. And these are some of the things they talked about. The bar, the long bar. We talked to the licensee who said, never any trouble. We talked to some of the local boys of the 1940s who said Saturday night entertainment was to go down and watch the Irishmen fight outside the long bar. 
But remember the floods, the Tyne is always flooding, worse than 1948, and we had several of our interviewees, this is possibly false memory, who were handed out as infants from the ground floor by their father to the top floor, rescued. The gala, some of them remember the prisoner war camp. There was a big prisoner war camp there with a special stockade for SS prisoners, and they remembered going through that as children. And if you were give the Germans a cigarette, you might eventually get a wooden toy from them. I'm jumped to transcription. As I said, my background is in linguistics, and if you look at that first transcript, that's the kind of thing we used to do. It took at least two and a half times the length of the interview, where you're recording, you're transcribing absolutely everything. That's a sample of real speech. People hesitate. They don't complete sentences. They have little fillers like you know, and actually, mm -hmm, that sort of thing. That, that's just life. The story about Sean Connery is true. Uh, you don't need to do it like that. You can boil it down. You can reduce. In fact, in that case, the interviewee asked us to delete the you knows. People don't realize they have these verbal ticks until you start writing them down like that. Second one, I could bottle this man. He was a natural speaker of Scots. Lovely. I wish we could realize his, 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 his voice on print um, more accurately than that. Third one, with Scots, you can pretty much they're more or less a standard way of transcribing Scots. Four was an ethical one. One of our interviewees said, oh, that family. Now, that family are still alive and <laughs> living in the Nungate. And she was quite right. They were all robbers. If you, <laughs> if you look at the court columns in the courier, uh, they regularly feature. But making this part of a public publicly available transcript is slightly tricky. Five is interesting because look at it carefully, number five. And then, when we had a second go at it, you'll see what it really was. <laughs> it doesn't dramatically alter the historical record, but it shows you <laughs> one person transcribing, and there is room for error. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the technical side, but there's loads of freeware to help you. The Oral History Center here will help you if you want advice on freeware which will, you can use for transcribing. We use this one. You can slow it up. You can take notes. Um, it's called Express Scribe. It doesn't cost you anything. You're all, I'm sure, many of you have, have been doing oral, oral uh, recording for quite some while. But if you haven't, I'm reminded of the words of Dr. Spock. Some of you may remember. Some of you may even have been reared after Dr. Spock. Who knows? But the opening words of his famous book on uh, parenting, baby care, are, you already know more than you think you know. So a lot of this is just common sense. But as with uh, oral recording, as with parenting, so with oral recording, you learn things as you go along. You learn things from people who know more than you do. So, simple thing. Remind, we were dealing with the very elderly first and we lost one, we didn't get quite down the ladder, uh, do remind them that you're coming to see them next week. Position. I usually do it across the table like that with the recorder there, but watch for table thumping. People do, they emphasize things, they lean on the table or they put the books out, and of course it comes right through the recording. Phones. You turn off your own, but we also recorded someone saying, oh, I'm being recorded just there, <laughs> <laughs> and making arrangements to meet his wife later. Photographs, great way of starting the recording. Bring it, ask him to bring along a photograph of something that it, is important to them. It's also another, it's a double win because it's another source of an image for the local archives if they'll allow you to copy it, and 99% do. If you're photographing them, do it at the end, and you need a photograph of them. Do it at the end when they're relaxed and they feel quite confident. Open questions, that again is obvious. We were doing a practice where someone said, did you enjoy your school days? No. Okay, that's the end of the conversation. <laughs> what you want is an open question. Tell us about your house. Tell us about your school days. And it's not a conversation. You want their voice, not your voice, on the tape. And it's very easy, especially if you're recording people who are only a few years older than yourself, <laughs> 
to say, oh, I remember rationing. Yeah, oh, we did that. We did this. It's not your voice. It's their voice you want. And if you're going to use it for broadcast, then it's a real nuisance to edit out your comments. So try and, uh, from the start, introduce them to the idea that you might not always, you might just nod, or you might just smile to try to <coughs> continue. Follow up. When you're doing the transcription, we send the transcription, of course, to the interviewee. They have to sign a consent form. They get a copy of the transcript. We don't give them a CD. Some people do that. But if we found out anything from the archives which chimes with things that they've raised in the interview, then it's nice to let them know about it. So we had a woman who uh, she remembered a street game called Can We Cross Your Golden River? Has anybody played it? I think it's on for girls. I don't know any boys who play it. But we found the rules for it and the little song that went with it. So we sent her that just as a part of the follow up. And you thank them, of course. Uh, these are some of the photographs, just samples of what people brought along. The lady on the right who wanted to know about the Golden River crossing, that's her parents on the left. Interesting for us was the prefabs in the background because we had people talking about prefabs and there are no prefabs now. The one in the middle, you'll see a shopkeeper standing outside the door. This was an interesting... You get contradictions when, you're, when people are being interviewed. We interviewed the niece of this woman who had helped in the shop, and to her, she was a saint. She said she was quite emotional. A woman in her 80s, she said, I loved her more than my mother. We interviewed other people who shopped at that and said she was a villain in the skin flint who sold corned beef that had been submerged when the river, you know, when the shop was flooded who bought ration coupons from the homeless people in the lodging house across the road, and who sold woodbines at threepence a time when she bought a pack of ten. So you get these contradictions, and you get rose-tinted memories too, of course. But that's just life. Conclusion. What we found is that very close-knit community, partially because of shared adversity. These were poor people living in difficult conditions, and they, as that quote said, we looked after each other. Funerals were very traditional. Corpse was kept at home, not in the undertakers. People joined in and walked to the graveyards. And the Numgate is both graveyard. You might expect it's got the tannery, the abattoir, the lodging house, and both had it in graveyards. Sense of difference, quite strong. I was surprised when someone said, you were never a townie, talking of himself. But they were townies. They were part of Haddington. But they weren't part of middle class county town across the river Haddington. They were part of working class uh, on the, uh, the other side of it. People in their 80s who remembered slights. Strange that. Uh, a boy that had crossed the river about eight years old. He saw other children playing football, wanted to join in, and that's what he heard. Lift up the ball quick. He's from a nungate. Uh, but also kindnesses. They treated you as an equal. And he's not. He's talking about the Brethren Sunday School. These people didn't go to the parish church. They went to either the Brethren or they went to the Episcopalian Church. And the Scottish Episcopalian Church has a long history of outreach to less advantaged communities. Product, you need a product. Any kind of research needs a product. Publish it if you can. Put, the, put as we do, the transcripts and the sound recordings are in the local museum. Uh, we are also working on a product which we, there might be time to see a little bit of it later. Pleasurable ex experience for everybody, for both sides. People say spontaneously, I enjoyed that. Would you like being interviewed? Uh, and just one last thing. If you recognise any of these words on the left, the Nungate is different because it has preserved... You can guess what language these words come from. They're hawkers. It's Romani. It's Romani, of course, and if you speak any Hindi, then it's just the same. We're very, very close. Jugal is our word. It's the word for dog, but of course it's the word for jackal in English. It's coming from Hindi. That one is interesting, Irican, because it's traveller's can't. It means an Irishman, but they've reversed the syllables. It should be really uh, Eranach, but it's secret language. On the right-hand side, Nungate nicknames. Kipper, used a lot of brill cream. Poker, thin as a rake. Skipper, it was once in a drawing board, as far as I can see. Bing, anybody called Crosby was Bing. And then the other ones are a mystery. Yellow Boots, it was a man with a foreign name and they couldn't pronounce it. It's like wipers of Plug Street. <laughs> they call them Yellow Boots. So we'll stop at that point. If there's time later, we'll look at some of the programs. <laughs>